بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today we will talk about Cushing syndrome and these are our references So let's start by a case A 35 year old woman has a hypertension of recent onset Review of systems reveals severe months of weight gain and menstrual irregularity On examination she is obese with a plethoric appearance Her blood pressure is 165 over 98 mhg There are prominent purplish stria over the abdomen and multiple bruises over both lower legs. The patient's physician uh, entertains a diagnosis of hypercortisolism, which is Cushing syndrome. So now in this video, we will discuss about the Cushing syndrome etiology and pathophysiology of these uh, signs and symptoms in details, inshallah. So this is a classical appearance of uh, Cushing syndrome, moon face, and here is the stria uh, concentrated in abdomen, and here is the buffalo ham, which is fat concentrated here under the neck. So let's start by etiology. We have three etiology in Cushing syndrome, one which is ACTH dependent hypercortisolism, which means that hypercortisolism is a result of increased level of ACTH so it is called uh, due to uh, two reasons uh, either Cushing disease which is uh, reduced by pituitary adenoma that means it is when it causes pituitary adenoma it is a disease not syndrome caused uh, not syndrome named uh, the second the reason of ACTH dependent ectopic ACTH syndrome so some tumors in uh, in, uh, in patients that reduce uh, uh, and hormones uh, like small cell lung carcinoma bronchial carcinoma uh, which are the most common uh, tumors producing uh, ACTH the second etiology is ACTH independent hypercortisolism cortisolism uh, independent which means that uh, the hypercortisolism uh, it does not depend on uh, ACTH level so that means there is low ACTH level caused by suppression or negative feedback of cortisol hormone Um, which is uh, caused by usually functioning adrenal tumor, usually adenoma and rare carcinoma of adrenal gland. The third etiology is exogenous glucocorticoid administration, which uh, is used in autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis in long-term uh, therapy. So now we'll discuss about the physiological actions of glucocorticoids, starting by stimulation of gluco uh, gluconeogenesis. So we have to know that uh, glucocorticoids, uh, glucocorticoids uh, have a catabolic effect. Uh, so in on carbohydrate and proteins and fats. Carbohydrate, it increases gluconeogenesis, the, hence increase uh, glucose in the blood. Protein, uh, increase distraction of them and decrease their synthesis, synthesis. hence increase amino acid, fat, also increase destruction by uh, lipase enzyme produce free fatty acid and glycerol so we have to know that they increase free amino acid and increase glycerol to uh, to be in the in this process which is gluco new genesis to be used here to produce glucose and increase its level in our blood this is for catabolic action uh, diabetogenic uh, what do we mean by diabetogenic uh, when the uh, glucose level increase in our blood as we say in catabolic effect the ribble stimulation of insulin but cortisol 
um, look like antagonist of insulin um, uh, on the target tissue. Uh, so, for example, here's the cell which is uh, which has uh, um, which is uh, an insulin sensitive cells. When the insulin acting on this cell to reduce its action to uh, to uh, make glucose entering to the cell, cortisol inhibit its action and decrease the sensitivity of the cells. So, uh, cortisol um, inhibit the uh, the glucose utilization by the cells and decrease the sensitivity of target cells to insulin. That means there will be increased glucose in the level and increased insulin resistant. And also we will find increased insulin level in insulin resistant. The second action is anti-inflammatory effect and suppression of immune response, which is uh, the most uh, used in therapeutic uses. So, uh, how does it produce the anti-inflammatory effect and immune suppression? First thing, it induces the synthesis of lipocartin, and which is inhibitor of phospholipase A2. What is phospholipase A2? Here we will do it. So, in the inflammation, phospholipids of the cells converted to arachnoid acid by phospholipase A2. Arachnoid acids by lipooxygenase and cyclooxygenase are converted to the molecules which are inflammatory mediators to reduce the effect or increase the uh, inflammatory cells like macrophages, lymph lymphocytes, neutrophils, and these things. So uh, what does cortisol do? It, it, is, it inhibits this enzyme, phospholipase A2, uh, hence, the inflammatory mediators will not be produced, uh, then uh, immune suppression is produced. It also inhibits the production of interleukin-2 and proliferation of T lymphocyte. Interleukin-2, which is important in uh, inflammatory mediator. It also inhibits the release of histamine and serotonin from mast cell, which is histamine, and platelets, which is serotonin. The third action is maintenance of vascular responsive to catecholamines, which is very important in stress condition. How does it occur? Uh, cortisol has a permissive rule in the arterioles, and it upregulates alpha-1, adrenergic receptor. What do we mean by a permissive rule? So let's suppose this is a cell and here is the uh, receptor for adrenergic, uh, for example, epinephrine or catecholamine. And um, uh, here is the acting of cortisol. Norepinephrine will not produce its action on this cell until the cortisol is uh, there. So uh, when the cortisol is not there or we have uh, adrenal suppression without an exogenous uh, uh, glucocorticoids uh, and we, um, we are in stress conditions, this will result in death. Because there is, there are, there is no uh, uh, um, vasoconstriction to increase the blood pressure in uh, stress condition like in uh, trauma or surgical uh, or surgery. So that's why cortisol is needed for vasoconstriction response of the arterioles to catecholamines. So uh, the result of the permissive effect that there is uh, an increased uh, vasoconstriction of arterioles and also upregulates alpha-1 adrenergic receptor which we uh, know that alpha-1 is responsible mainly for vasoconstriction of the blood vessels. The fourth action is inhibition of bone formation. How does it occur? It decreases the synthesis of collagen type 1 which is a major component of bone matrix by decreasing the formation of new bone by osteoblasts. So when we decrease the synthesis of collagen type 1, we decrease the formation of a new bone by osteoblasts. It also decreases intestinal calcium absorption. And we also uh, mean, uh, know that uh, calcium is a very important uh, component of bones material.
The fifth action is the effect on CNS. Uh, the glucocorticoids receptor are found in the brain, particularly in limbic system, which is uh, responsible for behavior and emotional. Um, it all uh, the cortisol decreases REM sleep and increases slow wave sleep. Uh, when we decrease the REM sleep and increase slow wave sleep, we result in increased awake time. As we know that in REM sleep, if there is any stimulus, any big stimulus, uh, the, uh, the, the, the patient or the human uh, will not wake up by this stimulus. But when there is our sleep in slow wave, not REM sleep, uh, any stimulus or any big stimulus will wake up uh, us. Now we will discuss about the pathophysiology of some signs and symptoms. How these signs and symptoms developed. The first thing is moon face and buffalo hump. How does it occur? First thing, this is moon face as we discussed before and this is a buffalo hump. Glucocorticoids stimulate gluconeogenesis as a result of blood glucose rise. When gluconeogenesis is increased, blood glucose rise. When blood glucose rise, insulin secretion is stimulated as is discussed before. When insulin secretion is stimulated, there will be a lipogenesis effect. But corticosteroids or glucocorticoids have a lipolysis effect. So when the lipo lipolysis and lipogenesis are get together uh, or are stimulated together, there is an uh, increase of fat deposition in certain areas. So there is a redistribution of fat in this patient. So in these areas, uh, these, they are um, in the face and the abdomen and in the posterior and the neck. The second one is GI ulcer. So large doses of cortisol may stimulate gastric ulcer secretion. When gastric ulcer secretion, it decreases resistance to ulcer formation. Um, so when uh, there is an increase in acid secretion, uh, it mainly results in duodenal ulcer. Um, the third one is acanthosis nigricans. Um, this is the typical picture of it. So when we see this picture on any human, we know that this human has an insulin resistant. Okay, so how this insulin resistant results? As we discussed before, insulin resistant, and this leads to hyperinsulinemia because uh, there is increase and increase in glucose level and uh, uh, pancreas is stimulated more and more to produce more insulin to get this glucose used by the cells. So result in hyperinsulinemia, which the turn, in turn uh, stimulates the proliferation of keratinocytes. So keratinocytes contain melanin, uh, and melanin result in this darkness, and also the hyperinsulinemia um, stimulates the proliferation of fibroblasts to result in this condition. The first one, ecomyosis. Uh, this is a typical picture of ecomyosis, and it is less common in Cushing syndrome, but we have to discuss it to understand how does it occur. So it's thought to be uh, related to a lack of connective tissue support in visual wall, owing to corticosteroid-induced reduction of uh, in collagen synthesis. So in the reduction, when there is a reduction in collagen synthesis, the visual wall will be weakness and this result in echomyosis. The fifth one is stria and bruising. This is the stria. This is a typical stria of, uh, of Cushing syndrome uh, patient. Bruising is the skin easily bruised and get injured. Uh, how does it occur? Uh, there is increase in body hormones that are thought to have a catabolic effect on fibroblast. So, when fibroblasts are catabolized and in distraction, required, uh, and we know that the fibroblasts are required to form the collagen and elastin uh, that needed to keep the skin to it, uh, it leads to dermal and epidermal tearing. So in this patient, there is a lacking of fibroblasts or destruction of fibroblasts that are required to form collagen and elastin, which make this skin tote. 
The sixth one is hyperpigmentation. Hyperpigmentation is not um, it's not found in all Cushing syndrome patients. It's also um, uh, it uh, it only um, uh, produced in uh, the if the etiology is ACTH dependent. Why? Because the hyperpigmentation is caused by ACTH hormone. Um, how does it occur or how that does ACTH produce that uh, hyperpigmentation? Uh, ACTH activates melanocyte stimulating hormone. Sorry. So, hormone receptors on melanocyte. So, when these MSH receptors uh, on melanocyte are stimulating, uh, it will secrete um, it will secrete a melanin, giving the skin uh, a tanned appearance. So melanocyte it gets stimulated by MSH receptor, MSH receptor by ACTH. Now also the compose some of the components of ACTH uh, are contributed to melanocyte activation. The seventh one is proximal muscle weakness. Hypercortisolism causes selective atrophy of fast twitch muscle my fibers. We have type 1 and type 2, type 1 which is a dark and type 2 which is light or bright. So this one, uh, hypercortisolism, uh, uh, select, uh, selective atrophy of these cells or of these my fibers. Uh, when these my fibers are uh, atrophied, it uh, it is uh, located mainly in proximal muscle. So that's why we see a proximal muscle weakness, not other uh, types of muscles. And that's it. Thank you very much.